love you. Thank you for joining us. I don't know why I did that, but I just felt like doing it. Pick up your Bible. This is Bible study on Christian television. Believe it or not. <laughs> okay. And, and your, your notepad so that you can take notes because we have the man that God has appointed for this time. Dr. David, right here. Oh, well, good morning, and it's great to be here. I'm looking forward uh, to... This is this is seen at all different times. And good afternoon, then. Okay. <laughs> and good evening and good night. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I look forward to discussing our topic today. I was... I was you were on television, the, the hotel we were in, on a Friday, teaching the Bible. As a matter of fact, that same day you sent me that text... Yes. Uh, a lady who was in a hospital, was in a hospital room, and the, a patient was watching uh, Dr. David Herman on, so she took a picture and sent it to me. Really? Phone. Yeah. It is, it is amazing. Television, Bob DeAndre had to, he's a visionary, businessman, um, very blessed financially, didn't need, <laughs> didn't need to start television which would be, it's coming up on 40 years ago, but God said, you're the man. And somebody that had a, a uh, license, but did not develop it because uh, you, you have, the FCC uh, gives licenses and you have to take them and develop them and turn them into a real functional full power station. Bob, his background was in, in a, he was an electrical contractor at a huge company in the state of Florida. And among other companies, when I first met him, he had, he had four large companies <laughs> and apartment complexes and everything. So he didn't need this, but God said, you're the man. And so now 20 television stations across the United States and on about three or four satellites because he was obedient uh, to God's call. So this today could be a message for you because the subject is depression, faith and depression. So without faith, it's impossible to what, Dave? Please God. Why is that? Because that is, that is the response... Uh, we are to have to him because of who he is and who we are. We must have faith to respond to him. We must have faith to please him, to interact with him, because that's the way he set it up. Same way your body needs to have fluids, well, you absorb it either through your mouth or through your skin, but if you don't have fluids, your body will die. It's required. You must have liquids in your body. Same way to interact with God. Faith is just part of his design, and there's no existence without it. And it isn't without depression pleasing God. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we, and that's, you can please God while you're depressed, and I'm hoping that's what people are, are understanding. It's the struggle in which we please God, not necessarily the outcome. I hope they watched part one, because, man, it, it just flows into this one. And, and today I want to make a, an opening comment, because we're not going to have much time to deal with it, but there is an element of depression that comes from the way your brain functions. The brain is an organ. Uh, your mind is, we think your mind is contained in the brain, but you know, you can't, you can't uh, um, find the mind of a person. But it's, it's located in the brain, but the brain itself is an organ. That means it has all the susceptibilities that every other organ does. Uh, an organ can suffer an injury. An organ can have a disease. An organ can malfunction. Depression can come from a, a malfunction of the brain. The brain sends its messages to your entire body through electrical impulses and chemical connectors called neurotransmitters. So when you feel something, your brain is the one that's telling you to feel that by releasing serotonin and dopamine into your body, uh, chemicals to make you relax, people, adrenaline to, to get you strength and, and, and joyful and energy to do something. That's all your brain releasing the messages to your body to different organs to release these chemicals. If your brain is not functioning right, you can read and pray all you want and your brain cannot send the signal. It's why anesthesia works. Anesthesia shuts down the brain's ability to send 
the pain receptors to the nerves so you don't feel what's happening to your hand. That's the brain doing that. And interesting enough, the brain itself doesn't feel any pain. You can put your finger into your brain and you, you wouldn't feel it. But the brain is the one that registers all the pain. Well, you, just please keep that in mind as you're dealing with your emotional state. If you cannot identify an outward cause, it's not sin and it's not responsibility, it's not physical fatigue, there's not a bad relationship that's doing it to me, and you can't put your finger on it, it very well may be a chemical electrical issue with your brain that might need medical attention. And just don't dismiss that by being over spiritual. Well, he, he sounds like a doctor. What's funny is his brother is a medical doctor. <coughs> How many years older is, is, is Hampton? Uh, two and a half, and my sister is about three and a half. And years she's old. in medicine. She, she's a, she's a, a, a chief nurse of the Indian Health Service for the. Uh, uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, Public Health Service. Uh, um, you know, so it's, it's kind of interesting. And, and you actually, you talk to doctors, don't you? you from yeah, time to time you go I, to Miami. I'm a, I'm a member of the Florida Bioethics Network and on the advisory board. Um, for the, It's the largest bioethics network in the and country. And they're doctors. Doctors and nurses and lawyers and, and uh, um, chaplains. And, and they have you speak. Yes, I, I had a chance to speak just a, a month or so ago. But I'm, I don't know anything about medicine, to be honest with you, but I can read, and I can read it. Yeah, I know. And, and, and he, if you go, he says, uh, he, he dismisses all this. I could read the same thing, mean nothing. He reads it and remembers it. But what I want to say, because I didn't used to believe this. Uh, when I was in college and seminary, uh, we, we were not really taught that emotional issues and mental uh, struggles could be related to something other than sin. Everything was always resolvable by thinking right and doing right, and your problem will go away. Well, that's a very idealistic, altruistic way of looking at a physiological human being. It'd be the same if I cut my arm off. I can't think and pray my arm back into existence. There's a physiological reality to an injury. Your brain is an organ, so just please keep it in mind. And, and if you can't, if this depression is going on longer and you cannot logically identify a real source, Go see a medical doctor and have your uh, chemical levels checked and, and uh, the synopsis is where the, the neurotransmitters communicate to your body, here's what's happening to you right now. Here's how you should react. If that's not working right, uh, you, you can't win and you only go darker because then nothing you're doing is helping. So keep that in mind as we talk about these other more spiritual aspects. There's some more prophets in the Bible. We talked about David and Moses and Job. Um, and Job last week. Elijah, 1 Kings 19.4. This is uh, about Elijah having a, a great victory. After a, a tremendous spiritual victory, he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree and he prayed that he might die. Wow. And he said, it is enough now, Lord, take my life for I am no better than my father. Now, give just a, uh, just a small background on, on what he did prior to this. Just prior to this, he had a, a confrontation with 800 prophets of Baal. And he set up uh, two different altars. And he put his sacrifice on the altar. They could put their on theirs. And he said, let's pray to our gods and see which one answers. Well, he just sits back and waits and maybe twiddles his thumb all day and all night as they are cutting themselves and, and speaking in ecstatic utterances and doing their chants and all the pagan rituals to get their gods to burn up this fire and nothing happens. Now, it hadn't rained for like three and a half years. So when they get done and they've completely failed, he said, go get all the water you can and drench my uh, sacrifice in water. And for whatever reason, to make them uh, acquiesce to the fact that God is so great, he can even resupply the water that they've lost or that this is not just because the heat is so bad that his, uh, his uh, sacrifice catches on flame. He drenches it in water. It's sitting there in a puddle of water. And he prays one time and lightning comes flying down and burns up the whole sacrifice. And then he kills the prophets of Baal. It's an incredible spiritual, military, political victory for Israel. But there's a wicked queen named Jezebel who sends a little messenger to, a to Elijah, I'm coming for you. And it sends Elijah, who has just had the, the ultimate victory for an Old Testament prophet, into utter despair and fear and he runs out into the wilderness and hides. 
and ask God, please kill me. My life is not worth living. Now, that's, that's after a spiritual victory. And we don't understand how oftentimes spiritual victories release adrenaline into our body that's and right. we have a spiritual emotional high that's right. that there's always a coming down. Yeah. And often that's when Satan comes in to tempt after a spiritual victory. Athletes so, experience that, don't they? Athletes struggle greatly with the coming down from the adrenaline release. Yes. Adrenaline is considered by many to be the most powerful drug on the planet. That it is as addictive as any uh, pharmaceutical drug you can imagine. Because I've heard some athletes say, I'm an adrenaline junkie. Yeah. And, and that's why it's so hard. That's why they have to gamble. When the sports life ends, they need something to jack up that same crisis moment where it's win or lose. It's, it's live or die. Or, or, They've got to get that again. Or a race driver like a Formula One driver, they have to have that. And, and they're driven towards extreme activities. And yeah. it could be immorality, it could be gambling, it could be overindulgence, it could be more risky and risky uh, adventures, but they need something to get that adrenaline high. Well, preachers can do the same thing. Oh yes. One victory is never enough, yes. so we gotta jack it up for the next time, yeah. so we top what we did last yeah. time. Well, at some point in time, you reach a limit and it's zoom. So this is what uh, happens. Go. God said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces wow. before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. Wow. So here's a simple little lesson. When I'm in despair, I must tune my ear to the subtle and quiet promptings of God. Be still and know that I am God. Even after a, a spiritual yeah. victory yeah. or even after a defeat, yeah. we must calm our hearts to listen to the subtle, friendly, entrenched, indwelling voice of God rather than looking for a spectacular outcome. Elijah either wanted to be killed or he wanted Jezebel killed. He wanted God to do something. Take care of this. Yeah, because I can't handle this fear from this woman, although I just destroyed 800 prophets of Baal. This woman scares me to death. He couldn't handle it, but it's when he wants God to, and God doesn't. God just speaks to him in a still, small voice. Now, God eventually takes care of Jezebel, but not at that moment. The next one is uh, Jonah. Jonah goes into great despair in a very similar way, but it's not because of a spiritual victory, although it involves one. It's really from bigotry. Jonah chapter 4. Now say that again. It's from what? Bigotry. And I'll, I'll explain just why in just a minute. Thank you. Oh Lord, please now take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. When the sun arose, then God prepared a vehement east wind, and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself, <laughs> and he said, It is better for me to live to than die. to die. He's better for me to die than to live. So a few verses later, God says to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, it is right for me to be angry, even to death. <laughs> but the Lord said, you've had pity on the plant for which you have not labored, wow. nor made it grow, which came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city, in which are more than 120,000 persons? Now, let me explain to you the bigotry, then I'm going to give you the, the okay, lesson. Okay, I get it that. now. I get it now. What Jonah was depressed about, he went to Nineveh to preach. But you remember how he got there. God said, go to Nineveh. And Jonah said, no way. I'm not going to Nineveh. And we, the Bible doesn't really tell us why, but history does. Nineveh was the capital of Israel's arch enemy. They were the Assyrians. And not to bring up any sore point for people, but let's say they're like ISIS. It's the way a Christian would look at ISIS. If ISIS had come into your city many, many times, beheaded people, taken people off, sold them into sex slavery, tore up your churches, and they had done that for centuries, you would hate ISIS. Yeah. And then God says to you, oh, go over into ISIS country and tell them that God loves them and wants to save them. Well, Jonah wanted nothing to do with it. It was, it was inbred racial, historical hatred and prejudice for the Assyrians. History tells us one of the most cruel, ruthless uh, cultures of ancient times. They're the ones who are famous for stacking up all the skeletons and skulls and pyramids at the edge of a town they had just defeated as a warning. They're the ones who invented crucifixion. 
So God tells Jonah, go to these people and tell them God loves them and God wants them to repent. Wow. So it was prejudice. He didn't want to do it. So he got in a boat and he went the other way. A fish swallowed him up, spit him out on dry land. He came into town and said, repent. The whole town repents. And Jonah goes into despair and he said, God, this is why I didn't want to come. I knew this would happen. He was upset and depressed over people he thought should be receiving the justice of God, getting God's mercy. It was his bigotry and his prejudice that caused his. So he ran out into the field and he's crying and moaning and God gives him some shade under a gourd tree. So he has a little bit of relief. And when the plant dies, he gets mad at God, says, just go ahead and kill me. Nineveh repented. Now my gourd dies. I'm done with it. And God said, you're upset over this gourd and you care nothing about the city. I care about the city. Now, here's the point. When I despair over injustice, either what I think is unjust, I must accept that God knows things that I do not, and He's always right, and He always does right. Well, that's the truth. And that's a hard thing for you and I sometimes to embrace, because we, we're pretty sure we've got it nailed down, what's right or wrong here, and who deserves what. That's why um, both in Psalms and Proverbs we're told not to fret over the prosperity of the wicked. Everybody is going to get exactly what they deserve. And thank God, you and I will not get what we deserve. When we get to heaven, we're going to get what Christ deserved. That's been given to us. We don't have to worry about who's getting cheated and get angry and despair over injustice and the unfairness of life, because life is unfair. And you hear people from time to time, they'll say, so so so-and-so could get saved, right? Yes, he could. He'd get born again. Well, if that kind of person's in heaven, I don't want to go. Yeah. And, and that's very finite, human-level sense of justice and fairness. And uh, even in Jesus' parables, he tells the story of the, of the laborers who come, and they work all through the day. At the very end of the day, a laborer shows up, and he gets paid the exact same thing everybody yeah. else does. Yeah. And the people say, well, what? that's not fair. Yeah. And Jesus says, it's the employer's business. If he chooses to pay that person the same amount, it's nobody else's business. In other words, what God allows to happen is God's business. He has purposes we will never understand in our human understanding of justice. But that, that plague does cause people despair. They often, because what happens is they think they're not getting a fair deal. And people around them are prospering who are cheating and lying and stealing. Yeah. And they're living right and nothing's going right. And they go into depression yeah. over the unfairness of it. Exactly. We must surrender. The next person is Jeremiah, one of the greatest prophets in Scripture. Wrote two books of the Bible. My favorite books. Jeremiah and Lamentations, which means crying and whining and, and um, complaining. Jeremiah 20. Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, A male child has been born to you. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon, because he did not kill me from the womb, that my mother might have been my grave. So what kind of a guy was Jeremiah? Jeremiah was a passionate, righteous, loving prophet who was so grieved by his ineffectiveness to reach his people. And he never had a family. Uh, you know, I, 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 I don't yeah. think so. Yeah. He never had a family, and he, but he never had any effectiveness that he could tell yes. on the people of Israel. Right. It depressed him. He, I'm wasting my time. Yeah. I'm a useless... I've given up everything. I, I'm a useless yeah. prophet of God, or God doesn't want to use me. I'm talking to a brick wall. The people get worse and worse. And then he said this in verse, chapter 20, verse 9. Then I said, I will not make mention of him, nor speak of him anymore in his name. But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back, and I could not. Wow. So I think there's a, a, there's a simple little truth there. Would you call that an anointing? <laughs> I would call it the power of the Word of God. Yeah. Shattering through our, our malaise that breaks through our despair and makes us see things from his perspective. When I despair over my own burdens yeah. or my ineffectiveness, I must fill my heart with the Word of God. That's what brought Jeremiah out of it. That's why his two books live to this day. Because the Word of God was so in him, it made him still serve God, although he saw no result. He was angry at the people. He was angry at God. He was frustrated by his ineffectiveness and the misery of his life. 
but the Word of God was in him and it burned up in him and, and had to come out. When we're in despair, even if you don't know what the source is yet, but you're in despair and struggling with depression, feed your soul with the Word of God. Oh, yeah. It may be the only thing that really pulls you out. It, have you ever gotten to the point where you go, I, I, I think maybe, maybe I need to go into something else. And, oh. and where, and, but, but that burning inside of you, I mean, because you love to preach, is so apparent that you couldn't do that. Uh, I, I, yeah, I, I fantasize, dream about, pray about all the time, God releasing the burden of yeah. pastoring yeah. and just let me teach and preach the Bible because I don't feel very effective as a pastor, but I feel like I can preach and teach the Word of God. Yeah. We've always said you should be a professor at Liberty University. And, and the Lord doesn't think that yeah. or I'd be one. Uh, so I, He's got me where He wants me and it's a burden and it, it wears me down and I wish I could release it, but the Word of God is in me and it keeps having to come out and it just keeps So it's, it keeps it's, 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 it's a burning. Yeah, it has, a, yeah, yeah. I, I, would, I would feel stifled if I could not, and I don't want to necessarily be up in front of people. I, this truth is in me. I want to get it out yeah. to people. It's not that I want to be a featured speaker, but give me somebody you to talk kinda, to. You know, there's about 11 million people that are in the network system. So, so you've ended up speaking to a few million people. Yeah, and that's a, that's a great comforting thought. Cause I, and Jeremiah's, I know Jeremiah's ministry was effective, although he never saw it. It obviously was effective. And missionaries many times, they're missionaries for like 15 years or whatever. They've they, never and, seen the results. Oh, they reach one or two people, but after they die, the dam breaks yeah. and, the, and a revival takes place. And, that, and that's what we have to understand. God works on a long-term yeah. scale. Yeah. He doesn't always work immediately. We're just, we're just a piece yeah. in this puzzle. But our piece is the most important piece to why, us. Why do we want to keep score? I led 10 million people to Christ. What do you think of that? I mean, we keep score. It, it makes us feel good. We, we are achievement-oriented uh, people. We have pride. We, and also, we, we want to be effective. We want, uh, that's part of what God made us to be, because if you don't have a desire to be effective, you're not going to be effective, first of all. That's true. <laughs> but some of the effectiveness <laughs> is completely has nothing to do with you. It's yeah. God granting yeah. things. Yeah. And that's where it takes faith. So here's one of the greatest Christians who ever lived, Paul. He struggled with it, and some people might be surprised by this. 2 Corinthians 1, 8 through 9. We do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were burdened beyond measure, above strength, so that we despaired even of life. Yes, we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God who raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver us and whom we trust that he will still deliver us, you also helping together in prayer for us. So when I'm despair over the suffering or trials that I'm facing, I must have this sentence of death in myself. And I'll explain what I mean by that in a minute and trust God. The sentence of death in yourself means that what Paul says in Romans 12, 1 and 2, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, you present yourself a living sacrifice. sacrifice. So it's not death. It's the sentence of death. It means I have died to self. I've decreed it to be so. My life is now yours, God. So a living sacrifice means you're not dead on the altar either. You're on the altar to live for God. A sentence of death doesn't mean you're dead. It means you have put yourself to death. As Jesus said, put to death your mortal members that you might serve God. It's a dying to self interest, to selfishness, to self-preservation, to self-advancement. One of the biggest Dying battles. To that. It's, the, it's the biggest battle for all of us, even those of us who think we don't struggle with it, because it's so subtle. We all strive for self. Yeah. Well, when our self then meets the obstacle and our dreams meet the darkness of despair, we suffer unless we've died to that. And we know, oh, no, no this is the Lord's business. The Lord wants it to grow, it'll grow. He wants it to die, it'll die. If God wants it to continue, it will continue. Does that take the Lord. drive away, though? No, it takes away the stress and the pressure and the tension. I, I had a moment like that uh, seven or eight summers ago, uh, which this, the burdens of our church just were too much for me, and I, I probably didn't sleep for two and a half years at night. I just couldn't sleep. I was uh, up all night solving every issue in the church I could try to solve, and by the next day, all the problems were still there. Everything I tried, the next day, they were all still there. It just it was just overwhelming me until one night when I was praying, it was it felt like God said to me, David, this is so much bigger than you. 
You'll never understand it. There's not a thing you can do to fix it. Just preach and teach my word. And I let go of it. Well, it was a transformational moment for me. Hasn't necessarily been a transformational moment for the church, although we are amazingly like uh, the widow's oil. We continue yeah, to survive. A few years ago, it should have been a gone church. We, it's an amazing testimony to God. But what it did for me was I looked forward every single day to get up, studying the Word of God, and preaching and teaching wow. when I was about at my wit's end yeah. and couldn't sleep. Now, I sleep like a baby now. I close wow. my eyes and boom, I'm out because I gave it up. Wow. So knowing that it really is in God's control and not yours takes away a lot of the stress. So you're free to give it all you got and let, let it be God's business. Because he gets the glory. And, and Paul said, it is God who works in you both to will or to want and to do of his good pleasure. Wow. It's God's business anyway. So uh, the next verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 16, where Paul is writing again, we have this treasure, this the treasure is faith and joy and uh, in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. Therefore, we do not lose heart. Listen to the statement. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. When I am in despair from exhaustion and lack of strength, I must look to God for renewal. And here's the way you do it. It's the next phrase that Paul writes. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. When I despair over all my afflictions, I must see it in the light of eternity. Wow. Those are all spiritual perspectives from which we can take the hardships, the disappointments, wherever they've come from, our own failures, our own mistakes, the schemes and plans of other people, just the mishaps of life, forces that you can't even control, or physiological difficulty you're having in your own chemical system, wherever the despair comes from, see it in the light. It's this light affliction for a moment because I have all eternity to enjoy the splendors of heaven, the glories of God, and the fellowship and warmth of love, and cast your eyes up there and seek the things which are above and not the things which are on the earth. Wow. Jesus Christ is the answer to every need you may have. God bless you. Bye-bye.